Welcome to Cooking School. Today's show is about the world's most widely consumed meat. Did you know that pork is that meat? And did you know that pork is leaner today than it was in the 1950s? We are making three delicious recipes. The first is a porchetta, a seven pound pork belly that's been seasoned with herbs, spices, and garlic, and then roasted until it's tender and juicy. It makes the most delicious sandwiches. It's perfect for a crowd. Then I'm gonna show you my favorite way to glaze a ham with cognac and brown sugar for a glistening presentation on the buffet table. And last, a great recipe for a winter's night, pork with plums and red onions. Now this is the pork loin that makes the center of a porchetta. Porchetta is the name for crispy roasted pork that's highly seasoned with aromatic herbs and spices. When Italians make porchetta, they typically debone an entire pig and then fold all the meat into the belly, roll it up, and roast it. My version today makes it much easier for the home cook to achieve the meltingly soft and juicy meat and crisp, crackling skin. This is the belly of the pork. This is typically what bacon is made out of. It's smoked or it's brined. And uh, this should be the same size widthwise as the loin of pork with which it's going to be stuffed. There are several variations on seasoning. Uh, but first, before we get into the seasoning, butterfly the loin. Very carefully cut it in half and flatten it so that it's all the same thickness. There, that looks good. What a beautiful, beautiful piece of meat. This is going to be rolled up in the skin. And now take the skin side up of the belly and score it with a very, very sharp knife, approximately a sixteenth of an inch deep into two inch diamonds. And it might take a little bit of elbow grease to get through that tough pork skin. But this is what cooks so crispy and delicious. And now we'll cut on the diagonal. Okay, so that is done. Now we're going to get ready to roll up the roast. And I'm putting down on my board butcher's strings about every two inches, long enough to tie the pork belly in around, around the loin. You'll see. But make sure you have enough strings and use a nice, cotton butcher's twine. There, now put your pork belly on top of the strings, making sure that they are evenly spaced and nice and taut. And now make the filling. We're using for this particular porchetta three quarters of a cup of sage, very finely chopped, about a half a cup of rosemary, half a cup of really fragrant oregano, six tablespoons of fennel pollen. Now this is something that is unusual. It comes from the fennel plant. When the blossoms turn into seeds, there's this beautiful yellowy anise flavored pollen on the plant that's harvested now as fennel pollen. And it's a wonderful scent. 12 whole cloves of garlic that have been peeled and very finely minced and essential, three tablespoons of lemon zest. Nice fragrant skin of yellow lemons. Stir this up with, oh, a goodly amount of black pepper and about a tablespoon of salt. This is the herb and spice filling. There are several variations on seasoning. In Rome, rosemary is dominant, while in Umbria, where this dish hails from, the Umbrians tend to play up crushed wild fennel. And now to roll up the meat. Lightly season the meat side of the pork belly with salt and pepper. In San Francisco, in the marketplace, porchetta sandwiches are extremely popular, and they are becoming more and more popular in many markets everywhere. It looks fancy, but it's street food. And ask your butcher when you're buying a pork belly that it's meaty, around 50% lean, and just get good quality pork. 
And now put your loin right in the center of the pork belly. Season this too with a little bit of salt and pepper. And the rest of the herb mixture. I must tell you, it smells really, really good. Pork loin does not contain much fat, so it would dry out if it's overcooked. And the juices from the pork belly keep this really, really moist. And now we can start to roll. Roll away from you. And we're gonna tie with our strings. This is basically one giant roll. This is the only way, if you didn't put these strings underneath, uh, one person could not do this. You'd have to have another person standing by to help. So this way, I can tie and there. Got that one. I'll do the next. Space those strings evenly. And if it's your first time dealing with such a huge piece of meat, well, take your time. And you're ready to air dry the roast in the refrigerator for three whole days uncovered. So no instant gratification here. Put this on a rack, uncovered, in your refrigerator. Now this is a little bit of make-believe. Uh, this has been in the refrigerator for three days. We made it three days ago so that I could show you an air-dried refrigerated porchetta. The other one has gone into the refrigerator for the next three days. So place the pork skin side up on a rack over a rimmed baking sheet, and I have lined the baking sheet with a piece of parchment paper. Your oven is preheated to 500 degrees. Set this on a rack in the lower third of the oven and roast for about 20 to 25 minutes. You're gonna hear some crackling. And after 20 to 25 minutes, reduce the heat of your oven to 325 degrees and roast until an instant read thermometer inserted right into the center of the roast reaches 135 degrees. That's gonna take about two and a half hours. So look how gorgeous this looks. Everybody's mouth is watering. It just looks beautiful and it smells even better. I'm snipping off all the strings. We don't want any strings attached. And then we can slice this into less than half inch slices. Because if you're gonna use this as sandwich meat, it's hard to eat through anything more than that. Even the underside is beautiful. The skin is crackly, uh, crisp, golden, everything it should be. I think the Umbrians would be very happy if they saw this and say, ah, they know what they're doing. So start to slice. It's very pretty. Mm, that's my favorite part. Be careful that your knife doesn't slip on the crispy skin. So each piece is beautiful. A spiral of herbs, of loin, of pork belly, and not a lot of fat at all. This is a well-cooked porchetta. You can make one just for show and then put all the slices around it if you're having a party. Uh, but let's see what a sandwich would look like. Slice your ciabatta in half lengthwise and spoon a little bit of a salsa verde on the bread. And put your porchetta I would slice it in half like this and put it on the bread. And because you have so much, don't skimp. Pile on the pork and a tiny bit more of the sauce. And the salsa verde is made out of parsley and shallots and olive oil and oregano. And there you have a porchetta sandwich that will make you famous. I did forget one thing, a little bit of baby arugula enhances the flavor of the pork. There. I guarantee this porchetta will impress your friends and your family and even you. The centerpiece of many holiday tables is a glazed ham. 
But I think roasting this impressive cut of pork with a brown sugar and cognac glaze deserves a spot at your dinner table more frequently than just the holidays. In fact, parties all year long could have a smoked glazed ham served on biscuits, served sliced for lunch. Uh, there are lots of uses for this wonderful, wonderful cut of meat. This is a smoked ham, which means that it gets its flavor from exposing the meat to the smoke from burning or smoldering plant materials, most often wood. Not only does the smoking process add flavor, it also cooks the ham, so that when you get this ham home, it is fully cooked. What you have to do is warm it and enhance it. When buying ham, allow a third to a half a pound per serving for bone-in ham. This is a bone-in ham. There's a bone from here all the way down to here. And this is like this part of the pig. Uh, transfer to a 325 degree oven and bake for one and a half hours. And the way I do that is wrapped in parchment lined foil. This warms the meat without drying it out. And I think this is a very, very important step. Don't just put that in the oven. It'll get a little dry around the edges. This way, every slice of meat will have the same tenderness, uh, the same delicious look and flavor. So put this on a rack in a pan. It just fits in. This is somewhere around 14 pounds. It is a beautiful ham. So get this into a 325 degree oven and bake for at least an hour and a half, maybe two. So here's the ham. I've let it cool just slightly so I could touch it. I'm gonna lift it out of the rack and put it on a cutting board. Oh boy, it's heavy. Ah, there. Keep the foil around it. That'll keep the juices from running all over your counter. Mm. I remember our hams always came from an old Polish butcher shop on the Lower East Side of New York. And uh, they have gone out of business. All their hams had the entire skin on the ham. So this was always removed with a sharp knife. And I'm going to remove as much of that as possible. I like to keep a fraction of an inch of fat covering the entire meat of the ham because that is what we're going to cut into a crisscross diamond shape. And it does taste really good. Uh, when it roasts with the uh, brown sugar and cognac glaze. Now, don't throw this away. This is very delectable to some people. My friend Lily uses this in her Chinese cooking. I like to make cracklings out of it. Now, this ham will probably be devoured at a big Christmas party, but uh, it is wonderful sliced and used in sandwiches after the party. And if perchance you do cut into the meat a little bit, take a taste. It's ready to enjoy. Really great ham. Okay, so this is ready to score and glaze. Now this takes a little time also, but we want to score on a diagonal, making a diamond pattern. And I like doing this very close together, small diamonds, because when you ultimately carve the ham, everybody should get a little piece of the fat, a little piece of the glaze, a little piece of the meat. So there's kind of method to my madness. So do you see these are all cuts going one way? I'm only going maybe a sixteenth of an inch deep. Just enough to catch the glaze, flavor the exterior of the ham, and look real pretty. Doesn't look like much now, but when it's glazed, it looks infinitely better. When I was a caterer, this was one of my favorite and my customers' favorite things for the buffet table at a Christmas party. So now wipe your hands and make the glaze. For this size ham, you'd need about two cups of dark brown sugar and cognac to soften. It'll be a, probably a half a cup of cognac this is brandy. Some people would prefer maybe using rum, but I think brandy is the best thing. So you make a glaze kind of that consistency. 
and you spoon it on. Don't try to brush it on. I just put it sort of up on the top of the ham. It's going to drip down, permeate all those cuts, and you put this into the oven and let the first batch of glaze kind of cook into the ham. Then you spoon some more and some more and some more until you get a really beautiful, thin, crunchy brown glaze all over the meat. So now this goes right into the oven. It doesn't look like much yet, but I promise you it will look fabulous. This goes right into the oven, 325. We may reduce the temperature in a little while. It's going to take around, oh, an hour to an hour and a half to get the look I want. So here is the glazed ham. And I've placed it on a serving platter. This is really almost a display platter because it would be easier to carve this ham on a big carving board. And I'm garnishing it for display with fresh watercress, fresh parsley. Mm, so beautiful. And you could just leave it green like this or you can uh, add a few little lady apples here and there on the platter. But sliced, this will become a highlight of your party. Served with twice roasted potatoes or scalloped potatoes, mashed potatoes. I can see serving this thinly sliced with biscuits. Now, don't throw out the ham bone when you get down to it. I use it instead of a ham hock to flavor split pea soup or bean dishes. And after the ham has been baked, it keeps in the refrigerator for an additional seven to 10 days. So you'll be eating ham sandwiches, ham salad sandwiches for a good long time. Serving glazed ham is one of my very favorite holiday traditions. And the best part, there's always leftovers. Fruit and pork have always been a traditional combination. I can remember Sunday lunches when mom would roast a pork loin and serve it with delicious homemade applesauce. While apples are the most common choice, there are many other fruits that are equally delicious, like peaches, apricots, or plums. Today I'm pairing plums with a quick cooking pork tenderloin. Let's begin. So this is a pork tenderloin. It's very tender, it is a boneless cut, and the tenderloin comes from right underneath the loin. In fact, pork tenderloin is the most tender part of the pig because these muscles are used for posture, standing up rather than moving, like the legs, which are a little bit tougher, of course. So pork tenderloin generally comes two to a package, and they each weigh about a pound each. This is one tenderloin. Now, remove all of the silver skin. It makes the meat contract when cooking, so it's better to have that off the meat completely. Now, this premium cut is relatively expensive compared to other cuts of pork. However, it's still much cheaper than beef tenderloin, and it's even more tender. Cut this tenderloin into about three-quarter inch slices. These slices will be pounded and flattened, sort of like a scallopini. I love pork, and I love it in pork chops, pork roasts, scallopini. You can even do a paillard of pork if you like. This is sort of like a paillard, only uh, slightly different because we're pairing it with fruit. So get all your slices ready, and all of these can be pounded in between two pieces of plastic wrap. This is a very, very simple recipe. There is no reason why you should not be able to feed your family a delicious restaurant dish like this each and every night if you have the techniques. So now this you pound just till about an eighth of an inch thick. Do you see how much bigger that little piece becomes? So then of course, just repeat the process but this works so well. You can have a butcher do this, but it's so easy to do at home. Just invest in one of these. You can also use the bottom of a heavy skillet. You could also use a big mallet from your husband's workshop. But don't use this side. This is for tenderizing. This is already tender, and this will only tear the meat up. Okay, so in a heavy skillet like this, melt one tablespoon of butter, 
with about a tablespoon of olive oil. I'm just going to saute these nice tenderloins of pork. And while I'm waiting for the butter to melt, cut the plum into wedges. These plums are absolutely delicious. Plentiful, inexpensive, and very nice, cooked or raw. Okay, so sprinkle with a little bit of salt and pepper. Okay, so here's our skillet. And saute, it takes, oh, just maybe two minutes to cook this pork. And then you can continue to flatten the rest of the pieces. Now this pork cooks extremely quickly. Keep your eye on it. You just want it to be lightly browned around the edges and cooked entirely through. And as soon as they are done, remove them to a platter and finish the rest of this very simple, delicious recipe. One loin should give you about eight really beautiful pieces of pork. Now in this hot skillet, just add one medium red onion, thinly sliced. I love how this smells. Now, if it isn't plum season, you can substitute plumped prunes. You can plump some prunes in some orange juice or in some white wine. You can substitute peaches, apples, of course. Even pears would be very good. The onions look very pretty when they're sliced like this. They were cut into wedges and then the wedges were sliced. And the moisture from the onions is melting all the little brown bits in the bottom of the pan, adding lots more flavor. Now add your gorgeous plums and let these start to soften. Again, another little tiny bit of salt and pepper. You want the plums to get soft, but you don't want them to lose their shape. Now, if mom were here, she would really like this dish because she loved plums. The best thing she made out of plums were plum pierogi. So there, the plums are starting to look nicely cooked. Add a quarter of a cup of red wine vinegar. Choose a nice, tasty vinegar and a tad more butter if you like. Not too much, but just a little bit to glaze the plums. And now you can just slide your meat right back into the pan just to pick up some of that luscious flavor. Doesn't that look really good? And it took a couple minutes. This is what I love about this recipe. I think it's done. Remove your beautiful slices to a platter or to individual plates. Mm, so gorgeous. And serve while it is piping hot. The plums pair beautifully with the pork. Everybody will really enjoy this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode of Cooking School. Line a baking sheet with parchment paper and top with a wire rack. Arrange one pound of thickly sliced bacon in a single layer. Measure one third cup packed dark brown sugar and sprinkle over the bacon. Season lightly with freshly ground black pepper. Bake at 425 degrees until the bacon is browned and crisp. Glazed bacon served with eggs, a perfect combination. Welcome to Cooking School. Everyone loves a delicious, well-made salad. Cold, crisp leaves of any kind of lettuce dressed with homemade vinaigrette is a perfect lunch. Today, I'm going to teach you a few classic salads. First, a traditional French bistro recipe for frisé with lardon and poached eggs. This may become your new favorite. Then, a chopped salad that my daughter Alexis loves to make, full of fresh vegetables, a great vegetarian lunch or dinner. Next, a classic Caesar salad with homemade croutons made in a traditional wooden salad bowl. Even the dressing is made in the bowl. And last, a Japanese-inspired butter lettuce salad presented in a most unusual way.
when I invite guests to lunch, I love to make frise au lardon. It's a French classic salad made with spicy greens, crisp bacon, creamy poached eggs, and a warm vinaigrette. A taste of Paris brought right to your table when you serve a frise au lardon. Frise is a member of the chicory family. It's also an endive. And what I like for this classic salad is just the center yellow leaves. And you can find this at the farmer's market. You can also find it in a grocery store. And uh, this is the center. It has a little tiny bit of green on it, but it's pretty. Uh, well washed, spun dry. The leaves should be separate. And then just fluff the leaves into your salad bowl. Now, the bacon. Use slab bacon. This you can find at the butcher. Good, fragrant, smoky bacon. It adds an excellent flavor to your salad. Cut the slab into quarter inch slices like this, and then cut the slices crosswise into quarter inch lardon. These will go into a large skillet and cook until crispy and brown. And don't throw away the fat. The rendered fat is for your dressing. So this is a, a little bit of a rich salad, especially with the poached eggs. While cooking the lardon, just keep turning them, and they're gonna get uh, evenly cooked on all sides. While this is happening, you can poach your eggs. Now, I love to make poached eggs, and I usually do the eggs in a four or five inch deep pot like this. Two tablespoons of white vinegar to the water. The vinegar helps the egg whites coagulate more evenly. And choose fresh eggs. The fresher the eggs, the better. And you can break the egg right into a bowl like that. And just insert your egg right into the water. Let it set. And then as soon as it sets a little tiny bit, you can turn it over with the point of a spoon like that. You want the whole yolk covered. And your next egg. Keep adjusting the temperature of the water so that it doesn't come to a rapid boil and cause the egg to completely disintegrate. There, that looks good. Now here's a trick that I can show you. If you want to make a lot of poached eggs ahead of time, uh, have a bowl of iced water, just as I do, right next to you as you remove the poached eggs. And they can sit in the iced water even overnight. Here's a very nice poached egg. You just put it in the cold water. And look how great this egg looks, so perfect. And then, right before serving, you just reheat it in simmering water. So here our lardons are perfectly cooked. Just remove them and you'll finish up your dressing. Oh, it's so fragrant of bacon. I love the smell of this kind of bacon. Now add three tablespoons of very finely minced shallot, which is a member of the onion family. This gives a very nice flavor to the dressing. And I did say that we're using the fat of the bacon as our fat for our dressing. And the vinegar is a sherry vinegar, sherry wine vinegar. And this, too, is utterly delicious. A little salt, a little pepper. Raise the heat a little bit so that the shallots just cook just a little tiny bit. You can add your lardon right back in, and you're ready to dress your salad. You just pour this dressing right over your frise. Toss. And serve. A nice mound of frise studded with those golden lardons. And we're going to top this with one of the poached eggs. Now here's another little hint. Poached eggs are very wet. So to dry the egg without hurting it, just put it on a piece of bread like that uh, because really the egg stays so perfect. And just slide it very carefully on top of your salad. Sprinkle with 
and salt and a little bit of black pepper. And before serving, I always like to cut a little slit right in the top of the egg so you know that it's perfectly cooked. So there you have it, a French salad that is fit for a French bistro. You can never go wrong serving this classic. This next recipe is from my daughter Alexis, who cooks three meals a day for anywhere from three to five people. So she's really busy and she loves to make beautiful food and this is a beautiful salad. And it's extremely delicious. The trick is to cut all of the vegetables into similar sized pieces so that each bite offers a colorful mix of flavors. Uh, first thing, corn goes into boiling water. I always add a touch of sugar, don't tell Alexis, and coarse salt about a half a teaspoon of salt and just a big pinch of sugar. And cook the corn for six minutes. Now, string beans are cut into about quarter inch pieces and eliminate the tip. That will look pretty in the salad, so just cut them into quarter inch pieces. Have a pot of water boiling. And again, the water should be lightly salted. It does impart a very nice flavor to the beans. So this one's ready to go right back into the bowl. And this can go right into our pot of water. I'll put the green beans in first and yellow beans. These are called wax beans or yellow beans. I love the color of them. They're so pretty. And Alexis's children love this salad. They've been brought up on a lot of vegetables and I think that when everything is cut up into a similar size, it's very appealing to young children. They think it's all just for them. So here's the yellow beans. They're a little bit more tender than the green beans, and so they can be put in now. I have a bowl of iced water right here next to me. And you see the ice is in the water, and then I have a strainer set into the iced water. That way no ice is gonna get into the vegetables when I finally take them out. Look at the color, isn't that great? So keep cooking those. Now I've pre-prepped all the other vegetables except the last tomato, just to show you. A plum tomato is good to use for this particular salad because uh, it doesn't really have very many seeds. It's a lot of pulp. Don't take the skin off. Just slice the tomato and squeeze out the seeds. Take the beans out of the water. Oh, they look perfect. Okay. We're just waiting for the corn. Six minutes and it should be ready to cool off. It smells so good. Again, this can be chilled also to make it easier to handle. Dry the corn on a towel, and you can take it off right onto the towel. It's perfect. And then just slice right close to the cob, but don't take the cob with it. Break up the corn. Mm, looks so pretty. So now we're ready to use this corn. This can go right into your salad bowl. And now the string beans can also be dried in the same towel. Oh, they look perfect. Add your tomatoes, your English cucumber that's been peeled, red pepper deveined and seeded, Yellow pepper, deveined and seeded. Mmm, red onion. And of course you could use white onion, green onion. Beautiful cilantro leaves. Jalapeno pepper, and dump in your string beans. Golden and green. Sprinkle with black pepper and two teaspoons of salt and best quality olive oil, about two tablespoons of olive oil. That's one, two. 
and rice vinegar. This is Japanese rice vinegar. It is really good. And this too, two tablespoons. And toss. Wouldn't you like to have this for lunch today or dinner? It is a very, very special and, as you can see, easy to make salad. So there you have chopped salad a la Alexis. This salad really became one of my favorites. I hope it becomes one of yours as well. Enjoy. Italian chef Cesar Cardini, who worked, strangely enough, in Tijuana, Mexico, probably had no idea how famous his simple salad would eventually become. A great Caesar salad is defined by its dressing. And as the story goes, Cardini had just cooked for so many people and the crowds kept coming and coming and coming into his restaurant. And by the end of the evening, he had nothing to serve them, so he invented a salad. He had a lot of greens, he had some garlic, he had some anchovies, and he had some crusty French bread, and he created what is now known as Caesar salad. There are so many renditions of Caesar salad, but very essential to the salad are the croutons. I'm using day-old crusty bread, and uh, I've sliced the bread about a half an inch thick, and then I'm cutting it into half inch croutons. They're good in the salad, they're really nice, and they soak up the dressing. And once you make homemade Caesar dressing, you will never resort to the bottled type again. So I have one tablespoon of butter and one tablespoon of olive oil heated in a big skillet, and I'm just going to cook my croutons right here on top of the stove. Watch them, they're gonna to toast and they're going to become crispy. Make sure they all get a little bit of that butter and oil. And don't forget salt and pepper, very important. Uh, for the croutons, about a teaspoon of salt and a half a teaspoon of black pepper. This will make nice fragrant croutons. Let's start with the dressing. You will need some salt-packed anchovies and put those four anchovies in your salad bowl. Crush those with two cloves of chopped garlic and a little bit of salt. Just mash this up with a fork. The anchovies will mash. So here the anchovies are getting broken. Crush those pieces of garlic with a fork. Okay, so now we're ready to add our egg yolk. Signor Cardini, <laughs> whoever he was, dropped his eggs into the bowl from a great height. From way up high, watch this, and it plops and breaks, see? So we don't have to do too much to the egg yolk. It's all theater. And I think Mr. Cardini, Signor Cardini, was quite aficionado of the theater. Everybody's made up stories of this guy. And now add a half a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. It's a little generous, but I like, I like mustard. And one teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce. Now, if you don't want to use the raw egg, uh, you can substitute one tablespoon of store-bought mayonnaise. Mm, see, now it's starting to get creamy. Look at this. So I think um, we are okay. I'm gonna add a little bit of black pepper. I love black pepper. Now, the juice of one lemon. I like to cut the little ends off and slice the lemon like that. And indispensable in the kitchen, and this is used all over Latin America and in various parts of Europe and the Middle East, the lemon squeezer. And it doesn't waste any of that delectable lemon juice. Whisk this together. And now add your olive oil. Just drizzle it in and you're going to make an emulsion, which is a liquid being thickened by the addition of oil. That's an emulsion. See how thick it's getting? And for a salad this size, you'll need about a half a cup of highest quality olive oil. So here is the basic dressing. Now to add the freshly grated Parmesan cheese. This is one cup. 
So here we have it. Look at that thick, delicious dressing. Okay, now the salad itself. Romaine lettuce is the lettuce of choice for the traditional salad. Now it's the one lettuce that people say you can cut. It actually looks kind of nice when it's cut crosswise. To stack it like this, cut lengthwise first and then crosswise. So cut it into, oh, like inch pieces. See how easy this is? Now avoid buying romaine in plastic bags in the grocery store if you can. Better to get free heads that have not been packaged and always, no matter how your salad is uh, sold, always, always, please uh, wash it at home and dry it very well in a salad spinner. Even if it says it's organic and packed in a clear plastic bag, wash your salad. Very important. So looking good, don't you think? Let them cool. Put the croutons all the way around and toss. Your salad dressing will coat every piece of the romaine. And this will be the best Caesar salad you've ever tasted and the best your family has ever tasted. And if you like, you can take a piece of Parmesan and make a few Parmesan curls to go over the top. A little more texture, a little more prettiness. And there you have a Caesar salad that even Signor uh, Cardini would approve of. Enjoy. Butter lettuce is sometimes overlooked when it comes to making salads, but it's one of my preferred lettuces. Its sweet, tender leaves pair perfectly with a fresh citrus and yuzu vinaigrette. And this salad is uh, unusual, it's simple to make, and it is absolutely perfect when cooking for one or two. Break up one of the little butter lettuces. As you get into the heart of the lettuce, the leaves are whiter. On the outer leaves, these big leaves, which I'm not going to use for this particular salad, they're darker green. I like the little center leaves, just about that size. So your lettuces should be well dried and broken into individual leaves. That's the salad. Now to make the dressing, this is the unusual part. Uh, we'll need some fresh ginger, and fresh ginger comes in the store like this, like branches, and we just need a piece about that size to peel ginger just use the edge of a spoon like this, and the peel comes right off. There's nothing easier than a spoon for removing the skin of ginger. I don't know who found this out, but thank you. It is the greatest method. Just look how clean and lovely that ginger looks when peeled with a spoon. If you were going to peel with a knife, you'd waste a lot of the ginger. This takes just the skin off. And so this peeled ginger is what you're going to grate. Now this was originally a wood rasp, which was adapted for kitchen use. And it is very, very fine grater. It acts pretty much like a wasabi grater, which the Japanese use. See how fine it is? It has a lot of fibers in the, in the ginger itself. And to grate it any other way is quite impossible. So this wood rasp is the perfect tool for the job. So two teaspoons of fresh grated ginger. Easy to do, right? And the juice of one lime. If you happen to have a yuzu fruit, which is a citrus fruit, uh, sort of a cross between a lemon and a lime. It has a bumpy green skin, a little difficult to find in the marketplace. But those are yuzus. They're grown now in California. They were imported from Japan. Uh, very flavorful, very fragrant. But we're using instead a yuzu vinegar, which is very, very nice. And we just need a tablespoon 
of yuzu vinegar, and a tablespoon of safflower oil. This is a great oil to use for fragrant vinaigrettes because it has no flavor, uh, it is colorless, and it doesn't seize up or thicken when it gets cold. It stays like this, and it's very, very high in polyunsaturates. So it's a healthier oil than most others. Very good oil. Safflower, comes from the safflower thistle. So that's the ginger dressing. Add two teaspoons of granular sugar. So it's a sweet dressing. And a pinch of salt. Just give it a little taste, important. Mm, really, really good. And a little bit of pepper. Now I have three slices of avocado. This is going to be our surprise at the bottom of our salad. And you can just arrange those on a plate. You can sprinkle that with a little bit of sea salt little bit of pepper and now toss your lettuce the smaller leaves first just toss in the dressing start with the smallest leaves and arrange the salad it's going to be kind of a mounded salad it's very pretty but this way each leaf is coated with that fragrant dressing I just don't like to eat salads that have partially tossed lettuce. And if you just drizzle the oil over it, it's not going to dress each piece. Better to do it in the bowl. I wish you could smell this. It's really, really good. Now you can make this, oh, in the kitchen, right before your guests sit down. The bigger the bowl, of course, the easier to toss the lettuce and the faster you'll be able to create your salad. Finishing touch, a little bit of toasted sesame seeds just sprinkled all over the exterior of your salad. And a little bit of your sea salt. And there you have an unusual, beautiful, Salad surprise with the avocado underneath. This is a Japanese yuzu salad. Enjoy it. Well, I certainly hope you've enjoyed this recipe along with all the other salads we made today. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Cooking School. For a creamy dressing, add two tablespoons of buttermilk and one tablespoon of lemon juice to a jar. Chop a half a teaspoon fresh tarragon and one and a half teaspoons of both flat leaf parsley and fresh chives. Then add the zest of a quarter of a lemon. Season with coarse salt and pepper. Lastly, add two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. Shake to combine and serve over a crisp wedge of iceberg lettuce. This recipe for a ruffled milk pie is an elegant and tasty dessert that served as part of a traditional Greek Easter celebration. Filo that's been ruffled, baked, and filled with custard. The pie emerges from the oven with a distinctive flower-like appearance, and it's fun to make and rather interesting. We're starting with clarified butter. And here we have a pot that's been slowly melted. The milk solids have accumulated in the bottom of the pan, which you can see there's a lot of foam on the top, and we'll just skim this off. I'm using a strainer to show you how much residue is left after you melt the butter and leave the milk solids in the pan. You don't want those milk solids. You want only the butter. Here we have a much clearer butter if you look at it. So uh, clarified butter also has a high smoke point, meaning it doesn't burn as easily as unclarified butter. And additionally, you can keep a jar of clarified in your refrigerator for a longer time. And you can buy it, but I like making it because I know that it's the butter I want to use. So, on to the ruffled tart. Here's phyllo. Phyllo tends to break really easily. This looks very nice, but it will dry out, oh, um, just dry out quickly. So I cover it with a flour sack towel that is slightly damp, not wet. Now, 
start making your ruffles. I'm using a large pan, three inches deep. This is like a wedding cake pan. And we want to brush the bottom of the pan with butter generously. I am also buttering the sides of the pan. You need a 14 inch pan for this recipe. You might have to borrow it from your friend who makes wedding cakes down the street. But uh, it's a good pan to have, actually, and you can use it for a lot of other things. Okay, so now start working quickly. And we're going to take one sheet of phyllo. And now quickly butter your phyllo, working with your very soft bristle brush. And then you gather your phyllo and kind of pleat it like this. And starting in the center of your pan, you are going to make it into a spiral. And when it has the butter on it, it's actually more malleable. And you want to start making your rosette, which is basically like that. And your next sheet, we're gonna need about 14 sheets of phyllo for this particular recipe. So it's gonna get a little buttery on the table. Good to work on a clean breadboard, a stone surface. Keep going and going. And don't get disheartened when it starts to crack because those cracks will disappear. So there, how gorgeous is that? Now brush it with a little bit more butter on the top. Be gentle, you don't want to tear the leaves any more. And now sprinkle with very light sprinkling of cinnamon. Transfer right to a 350 degree preheated oven and bake until golden brown, about 25 to 30 minutes. So here's our rosette. Doesn't it look absolutely gorgeous? And now we're going to pour over this a very simple but delicious vanilla custard. And the custard is six eggs. Break them up with a wire whisk and have scalding on the stove three cups of whole milk. And add one cup of super fine sugar. Super fine is an extra fine grain of sugar if you don't have super fine, you can actually put one cup of sugar into your food processor and process it. It will get quite fine. A little hint. And one teaspoon of your best vanilla. Oops, best vanilla. <laughs> that might be a little vanilla-y. So when the milk comes up to a boil like that, it's scalded. Now we want to temper our custard. So take a scant scoop of hot milk and quickly whisking your egg mixture, add in a stream the, the hot milk. What we're doing is warming the egg yolks without burning them or curdling them, as, which is the real problem. Just add all the milk. And the nice thing about this is that the custard is actually going to get cooked right in the pan with the phyllo. And we're going to carefully pour this custard right over the rosette. So all the little nooks and crannies of the phyllo are being filled. Pop that right back into the oven, 25 to 30 minutes. You'll see the custard set. So that's what it looks like when it comes out of the oven. So now before cutting and serving, sprinkle very lightly with confectioner's sugar. It's starting to look more like a dessert. And a tiny bit more of the cinnamon. Not too much, good. And then with a very sharp knife, you can cut through the crinkly phyllo, cut it into wedges and serve it like a pie. Oh, look how pretty. Now that is a fine use of phyllo, an edible work of art. In Greece, around Easter time, you'll find sureki, 
a braided holiday bread traditionally baked at home on the Thursday before Easter, and it's embellished with red hard-boiled eggs. Thoreki loaves are given as gifts to family and friends to celebrate the festive season. We're using bread flour to create a good gluten formation. So into the bowl of your mixer. Now this is an easy dough because everything goes right into this bowl. Uh, there's no proofing of the yeast or anything. So one cup of room temperature water, three tablespoons of honey, Greek honey if you're making a Greek bread, and three quarters of an ounce of fresh yeast. Fresh yeast, you will might have a little bit of difficulty finding, but it's really worth it. And this is a living microscopic organism which converts sugar or starch into alcohol and carbon dioxide and causes the nice rising of the dough. So let this just sit for a moment to dissolve. And the honey is like food for the yeast. I love making yeast doughs. One tablespoon of salt, one tablespoon of orange zest, and a quarter of a cup of vegetable oil, and bread flour. We're going to use one and a half pounds, which is about four and a half cups. Now you can weigh if you'd like, which works very, very well, or measure carefully dipping and leveling in a jar like this. And one last thing, the sugar. This is a slightly sweet bread, so a quarter of a cup of sugar. So that's everything except the egg yolks. Now the machine is fitted with a dough hook which will mix and knead the bread at the same time. And I'll just turn this on. I still have to add the egg yolks, eight egg yolks and reserve the egg whites for meringues, for other things. And we're going to start adding that because the dough needs a little bit of moisture. So let this knead and knead. The dough used in Sereki is rich with eggs, making it similar to Jewish challah bread and other traditional egg breads made around the world. So once the dough starts flopping around like that and comes away from the sides of the bowl, it's pretty much done, as much as the machine will do. Uh, lift this up, release your dough hook. Still sticky, so you're gonna do a little tiny bit more kneading. But what a gorgeous color dough, greatly enhanced by those farm fresh organic eggs that I used. So scrape away this little bench scraper works very, very well for cleaning up the bowl and the mixer. Scrape down the sides. And this is gonna make one big challah bread. And when I say big, wait till you see how big. So scrape everything out of the bowl onto a floured board. And look at how pretty. You can see the little specks of orange zest and flatten this out. Don't incorporate any more flour into the dough because you want a moist dough. And just pull down the top here, pull up the bottom, brushing off excess, fold this in, and this. So you're making a nice little package. And this goes right into an oiled bowl. Oil with some unflavored vegetable oil, like a safflower oil will do. And then a piece of plastic wrap brushed with a little bit more oil to cover the whole thing. Put this right on the surface of the dough and over the edges because you don't want the dough to stick. And put this in a dry, warm spot until it's at least doubled in bulk. So here is our dough. So yellow, so great. Now turn this out onto a floured surface. You don't want a lot of flour. It's like a beach ball. Now deflate the dough and cut it into three equal pieces. Use a bench scraper like this. It works very well. And each of these three pieces roll into a snake 18 inches long. But try to make the cylinders pretty much even because you want a nice even bread. Three. 
and then you pinch the ends together and you'll tuck this under and braid as you would a hair braid. Over, over. A tight braid would be good. I think that's good. Now, on Easter, they sometimes insert a red hard-boiled egg, and we'll show you what that looks like, but I prefer baking this without the eggs and serving it with the eggs on the platter, just because the red kind of bakes off into the bread and people don't like eating that. Put this on the diagonal and, again, cover with an oiled piece of plastic wrap. If you don't oil your plastic wrap, it will pull the dough when you try to remove it and make little ugly marks. Now put this in a dry, warm place until it is doubled in bulk. So now uncover your bread. This is one egg beaten with a fork. That's your glaze. And carefully, lightly brush every single square centimeter with your egg glaze. Don't press because <laughs> you'll deflate what has so beautifully risen. You can brush once and then wait a minute or so and brush again if you want a really, really deep brown crust. Preheated 375 degree oven. It's gonna take about an hour to bake. Now, if you were going to insert eggs with the eggshells dyed red, put your bread into the oven for 10 minutes. Remove the bread, stick these eggs into the braid then put it back in the oven and bake for the rest of the hour. So now here are the two gorgeous breads that we have made. Red eggs are an important part of the Eastern Orthodox Easter tradition. The red eggs symbolize the blood of Christ, rebirth, and renewal. I do not suggest you eat them because they've already been hard boiled and then they have been baked in the oven for an hour and they're not very tasty, but they are very pretty. And I just want you to see this is very light how pretty that would be on your table. And I know you're dying to see what it looks like when it's sliced. I can just take a nice piece off. It's crusty. It's soft and flavorful on the inside. Don't slice it too thickly. Serve it with unsalted butter. Wouldn't you like to have a taste of this right now? A Greek classic that you will want to make and share.